a reading from the beginning of the Book of Wisdom. Love justice, you who judge the earth. Think of the Lord in goodness, and seek him in integrity of heart, because he is found by those who test him not, and he manifests himself to those who do not disbelieve him. For perverse counsels separate a man from God, and his power, put to the proof, rebukes the foolhardy. Because into a soul that plots evil, wisdom enters not, nor, d nor dwells she in a body under debt of sin. For the Holy Spirit of discipline flees deceit and withdraws from senseless counsels. And when injustice occurs, it is rebuked. For wisdom is a kindly spirit, yet she acquits not the blasphemer of his guilty lips, because God is the witness of his inmost self and the sure observer of his heart and the listener to his tongue. For the spirit of the Lord fills the world, is all embracing and knows what man says. The word of the Lord. Be Guide me, Lord, along the everlasting way. O oh Lord, you have probed me, you know me. You know when I sit and when I stand. You understand my thoughts from afar. My journeys and my rest you scrutinize. With all my ways you are familiar. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you knew the whole of it. Behind me and before, you hem me in, in, and in rest your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? From your presence, where can I flee? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I sink to the netherworld, you are present there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall guide me, and your right hand hold me fast. Dominus Fobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam, Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause sin will inevitably occur, but woe to the one through whom they occur. It would be better for him if a millstone were put around his neck and he be thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he wrongs you seven times in one day and returns to you seven times saying, I am sorry, you should forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Verbum Domini.
Our responsorial psalm today, which is Psalm 139, reminds us that we cannot hide from God, nor can we deceive him. He's present everywhere, and he knows everything, even the innermost secrets of our hearts. And he knows what we're going to say even before we say it. So we cannot elude God no matter how hard we try. But rather, this can serve as a motive for confidence, knowing that God is always present. He knows everything we do. He is always aware of what we're doing, what we're thinking, what's in our hearts. So practicing the presence of God or being aware of his loving presence, which this Psalm 139 again emphasizes, it's a source of strength. It helps us to make virtuous decisions and to renounce temptations in our day-to-day lives. St. Teresa of Avila would write in her book, The Way of Perfection, that wherever you speak, God will be close enough to hear. She goes on to say, Try not to make a stranger of so good a guest, but with great humility, speak to him as you would to your father. Petition him as you would your father. Tell him of all your doings, Ask him for his help to do good. And Pope John Paul II emphasized that this Psalm 139 is really a psalm of trust. Reflecting on this psalm, he said, God is always with us, even in the darkest nights of our lives. He does not abandon us. Even in the most difficult moments, he remains present. And even in the last night, in the last loneliness in which no one can accompany us, the night of death, the Lord does not abandon us. He is with us even in the final solitude of the night of death. And we Christians can therefore be confident because we are never left on our own. God's goodness is always with us. So Psalm 139 is a wonderful prayer, a wonderful psalm to pray, especially when we want to grow in our confidence and our trust in God. Looking at today's gospel, our Lord talks about scandal, the need to correct and forgive, and then he concludes with a short lesson on the power of faith, even just a little bit of faith, what God can do with that. So he begins with a warning about scandal, and scandal is an act or an omission that leads another person to sin. Our Lord gives a very graphic image to emphasize how serious the sin of scandal is by saying that it would be better if a millstone were put around one's neck and that they were thrown or cast into the sea than for one to cause one of the Lord's little ones to sin. So to set a stumbling block before the faith of God's little ones is so serious because it can gravely harm their relationship with God. And if another's faith is not strong, it can even destroy another's faith. And if we have given scandal, we can still be forgiven by repenting and making a good confession. Thanks be to God. And we should do whatever we can to make reparation for the stumbling blocks that we may have set up for others or to lead others astray and into sin. But a great reminder from this gospel is that we have to do whatever we can at all costs to avoid leading another person away from God. And in addition to this warning about scandal, our Lord states the necessity to correct and forgive. And he says very simply, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And we know that admonishing the sinner is a spiritual work of mercy. And when done appropriately, it's an act of charity. And it can help withdraw another from sin or the danger of sin. And of course, it's most effective when it's done with humility, when it's done with kindness, and in charity. It's not about trying to humiliate another person. Rather, it's expressing concern for their soul. We want to help another get to heaven. And if we discern that we are in a position to make a fraternal correction, it's good to pray for the Holy Spirit's guidance. Lord, Holy Spirit, give me the words to say. I want to say all that you want me to say and only what you want me to say. We could also consider that if I was in the position of this person, who I feel that the Lord's leading me to to speak to them, how would I want to be addressed? I think I would best receive it if I could tell by the manner in which I was approached that this person really was looking out for my good. They really wanted to help me get to heaven. So we also hear from St. Matthew's gospel. Today's gospel is from St. Luke. St. Matthew tells us in his gospel Um, recounting our Lord's words and teaching that correction should first be offered privately 
and then having recourse to others if that doesn't work. But again, this is a spiritual work of mercy, and as St. James says clearly in his letter, My brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Again, we're also benefiting our own souls when we help another. And after our Lord tells us to rebuke or correct our brethren who sin, he also counsels us to forgive them if they repent. Of course, we should always seek to forgive others, right? We don't want to allow another person's sin to damage our relationship with God. But we're called to imitate Christ in this regard. Our Lord has been infinitely patient and infinitely merciful with us. We should likewise treat others with mercy and patience. As our Lord clearly taught, unless you forgive, you will not be forgiven. And the measure you measure out will be measured out to you. And we know it's very easy, perhaps based on our own experience, it's very easy to hang on to resentment in our hearts. And thankfully, we do not have to feel good about forgiving others. But we know it's an act of the will. Lord, I forgive this person. I pray for them. I pray for their conversion, for their growth and holiness. It's important to know as well, it's important to know that when we do forgive someone, we're not approving of what they did or what they're saying what they did is okay. Sometimes concrete changes need to happen after um, we forgive someone. But we can also ask God to heal our memory because we do not want to replay whatever was done to us over and over and over again. The enemy certainly can use that to try to influence, to stir up resentment and hatred in our hearts. So again, we're reminded today that to forgive others, to not hang on to that, to imitate Christ in forgiving others. And the final part of today's gospel recounts the apostles asking the Lord to increase their faith. And it's very interesting that they ask to increase our faith after the Lord gives them this very difficult teaching. Lord, help us to be able to forgive others. Help us to be, on, to be vigilant because we don't want to lead others astray by causing scandal. And so they immediately say, Lord, increase our faith. We need faith. And so this is a very good prayer to make our own. Lord, increase my faith. In fact, we do pray this right at the beginning of the Holy Rosary. We pray for an increase of faith, hope, and charity. Faith, we know, is a free gift from God, and it's nourished by not only asking that the Lord increase our faith, but also by regularly, even on a daily basis, meditating upon the Word of God and seeking to put it into practice. It also grows through the worthy reception of the sacraments. And when the Lord gives the example of the power of having faith the size of a mustard seed, he is calling us to have a greater trust in him. And we see in his teaching that faith is powerful and that God can accomplish great things, supernatural things, even with a little bit of faith, as he says, the size of a mustard seed. We also honor today the first U.S. citizen to be canonized, Mother Frances Xavier Cabrini. And she gives us a concrete example of what it looks like to place one's entire trust in God, despite one's weaknesses and lack of resources. And this Italian-born saint took as her motto, St. Paul's words, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. And her trust in God was to such a degree that she would say to her sisters, this is based on her own experience, she said, I have already learned that whenever I failed in any undertaking, It was because I trusted too much in my own powers. None of us will fail if we leave everything in the hands of God. Under him, the question of possible and impossible ceases to have meaning. We can think as our Lord said too, with God, nothing is impossible, right? So we seek to follow her example. Mother Cabrini knew that by her own strength she could do nothing, yet by her trust, her docility to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit, she'd go on to establish her own religious institute, despite having been dismissed twice already previously from religious life because of her poor health. She would also cross the Atlantic Ocean, something of which she was terribly afraid of since childhood, not once, but over 30 times. And the motivation to overcome her fear was a zeal for souls, a zeal which took root in her heart at the age of 13 when she heard a missionary priest preach about the missions in China. 
and she felt inspired. Her heart was set on fire. She wanted to go to China. She wanted to go to the East to preach the gospel. So she studied. She became a teacher. She, refounded, she founded this religious institute, uh, calling it the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart. And then she went to the Holy Father, Pope Leo XIII, telling him of her desire to go to China with her sisters. His response was not to the East, my daughter, but to the West. And he desired that she go to America to serve and to care for the many Italian immigrants who are often found in very poor living conditions, both material and also spiritual. And there was no hesitation on her part when she heard the Vicar of Christ tell her not to the East, but to the West. She truly saw that as the will of God for her life. And she immediately set out with her sisters to come to the U.S. And she arrived in New York in March of 1889. And over time, again, because she was constantly trusting in God, she knew she could do nothing on her own. She ended up founding 67 institutions in North, Central, and South America, as well as in Europe. And these were orphanages, they were schools and hospitals. But she wasn't satisfied with merely providing for the physical needs, the material needs. She also sought to provide for the spiritual needs. But she wanted to instill in those she cared for, she wanted to instill Christian virtue, holiness. St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, who is later named the patron saint of immigrants, again knew that she could do nothing of her own accord without the help of God. And she truly lived out her motto, which she took from St. Paul, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Now in the collect at the beginning of today's mass, we prayed that by the example of St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, that we might be taught to have concern for the stranger, the sick, and all those in need, and to be able to see Christ in all the men and women we meet. So we ask her to pray for us today, to intercede for us, that we might truly see Christ in others, that we might generously serve those in need, and that we make Mother Cabrini's simple prayer our own. For she wrote, O oh Jesus, I love you very much. Tell me what you wish me to do and do with me as you will.